So we've been doing a study called Roots, our Pentecostal distinctives. Now, there is a need, uh, not only in our local church, but across the nation in our Pentecostal churches, that we remain true to our identity, who we are. First and foremost, we are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are believers in the Word of God. First and foremost, we are Christian. Our distinctive is Pentecostal. And uh, because of the multicultural city and multicultural church and uh, the different religions that come in and different faiths that sit before us, and there's a lot of confusion and maybe not understanding exactly what does it mean to be Pentecostal, we felt the Holy Spirit lead us into this series on roots, our Pentecostal distinctives. We, we started a few weeks ago. We did a Pentecostal introduction. And there we talked to you about how the word Pentecost is an Old Testament word, and it's a New Testament word. We know that uh, Pentecost was one of the feasts that the Hebrew people celebrated, uh, one of several. And they would celebrate the Feast of Harvest, the feast of, and the Feast of Pentecost was one of those feasts. In Acts chapter 2, it was during the celebration of Pentecost that God poured out Pentecost, that God poured out the promise of the Father and, and the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church. So it's a New Testament term as well. And we get our name, we, take, we took our name from that experience and not just from the title, Pentecost. We also looked at divine healing, that we believe in divine healing, that when we pray for the sick, we have an, an expectancy, we have faith to believe that God, the great physician, will heal the sick. Uh, last Sunday, Pastor Godfrey spoke regarding uh, Jesus being the way, the way to the Father for uh, the atonement. Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. No other name given among men. It's through Jesus Christ, the work of the cross, the shed blood of Jesus Christ, our repentance. We come to uh, a place of repentance, and we ask Jesus to be our Lord and Savior. He comes in, he, he cleanses us, and we become a child of God. We're born again, and we begin to live for the Lord. It's all wrapped up in that salvation. Our belief is that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. And whosoever will may come. Amen? It's for all. The whole world Jesus died for. I want to speak to you today on a very important subject that we need to clarify that the Bible is the Word of God. That we believe in the inspiration of the Scriptures. In uh, 2 Timothy chapter uh, 3, verse 16, if you have your Bibles, would you turn there, please? Find 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. We believe that the author of the Bible is God himself. Would you look at on the screen, it says, all scripture. Can you say the word all? All scripture. Very important word. From the first verse of the first book to the last verse of the last book and every verse in between, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All Scripture is given by inspiration. That, that word, uh, inspiration, it means God's communication to humanity. Inspiration here means action by God. If you quit breathing this morning, you will have no action. Amen? God breathed. His breath was released. It was action. Action from God. God 
uh, created this whole world where there was nothing. God created everything, the work of the Holy Spirit. In Psalms 33, verse 6, it says, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Now watch this. And all the host of them. In other words, nothing, everything was made by the breath of his mouth. Do you see that? And all the host of them, by the breath of his mouth, it's the same word that you find in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. It, it, it means the breath of God, God breathing, the action of God. It means the work of the Holy Spirit, no, upon divinely chosen writers, men and women. But it was the action of God. Look at Pastor Bob. It was God's doing. It was God's choice. It was God's action. And he breathed out. He breathed out upon chosen individuals to begin to write the scriptures. So the phrase in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, in the Greek, it says, given by inspiration. In the Greek, that is simply one word. Theo, uh, let me say it, Theonistius. Theonistius. What, Theo means God, and Nistius means breath or breathe. All scripture is breathed. It's God's breath. Are you with me? Are you with me? The inspiration of Scripture, every word is inspired. Every word. Do you believe that here? We believe that every word is inspired. God breathed. Now, in Matthew chapter 4, in verse 4, Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by, what's it say? Every word that proceeds from where? Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every word is God breathed. The scripture is the breath of God moved upon inspiration. It's not the inspiration you get tinglys or, you know, it's not, oh, he was inspired to write a poem or he was inspired to write a song. No, that could be the work of the Holy Spirit, but this is a deeper level. The breath of God came upon these individuals and every single word, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Very important that we understand this. Do you know that when Jesus, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, uh, Jesus was led, someone said it this morning, led out into the wilderness, and there he did hand-to-hand -hand combat with the devil. And the devil came after him, trying to attack who he was, his identity, tempting him at different levels of temptation. And how did Jesus fight the enemy? With the word of God. Why, why does the Son of Man, why does Jesus Christ use the word of God? Because the word of God is inspired. It's the very breath of God. And Jesus said three times, it is written. It is written. Devil, it is written. What I'm quoting to you is the breath of God. What I'm quoting to you is the very breath of God. It is written. I want to encourage you. When you're going through a challenge, when you're going through a trial, when you're facing temptation, what you ought to use is the word of God to help you fight your battle. The word of God is inspired. It's the very breath of God. Every word. The Bible is fully and completely God's Word. 
in, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. Listen, listen to this. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man. This is not man's doing. This is not something man made up. It says there, For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by whom? By the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit moved upon these men. The inspiration of God. So the Bible, we believe in this church that the Bible is the inspired word of God. And it was written by men and women. So what we have here is a divine human work of God. A divine human work of God. God chose, it was God's choosing upon different men and women. This inspiration came to them. And they began to record what God was giving to them. Partnership, but under the inspiration of God. And, and while human writers employed words, employed words of their own language in their own culture. I know some of you are all from different cultures. It, right? We, I mean, this is a very multicultural church. And sometimes I have to listen very closely. Or maybe ask Patricia because they get talking some Jamaican language. I, and I have to say, uh, Patricia, what, what did they say? He didn't take the culture out of the person. He didn't take, uh, you know, their, their experience away from them. But God used their language. God used their culture. He used their personality. But they were all chosen by God. He used their education. I mean, Paul was very learned. Amen? Paul was a, a scholar. Uh, Luke was a doctor. Matthew was a tax collector. Uh, he used different people. Esther. Uh, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. So he used different people from different backgrounds and personalities, experiences, and circumstances. But God, God guided the process so that each word would accurately, without mistake, convey his message. Hallelujah. The message is God's. So we believe in the inspiration of scriptures. Number two, point two. We believe in the authority of the Bible. The Bible is God's authoritative revelation to you and me. Uh, it imparts a revelation. It's God's authoritative revelation to you and to me in 2018 and onward. It gives us understanding. Gives us uh, direction. You see, it imparts saving knowledge. It teaches. It rebukes. It corrects. It trains. It equips. It's our authority concerning salvation. It's our authority on how we should live our lives. We don't live our lives according to the culture. And don't ever use that excuse. Even your family background is no excuse for the way you live. This is your authority on how you should live your life. This is your authority on your attitude and how you should conduct yourself. It must align up with the Word of God. The Word of God is the authority the final word is God's word concerning Christian ministry or how we do ministry in this house. How we do ministry in this house ought to flow 
from this book. If it's not in the book, let's not do it. It ought to flow from the book. How we do ministry. What we preach from this pulpit. That we preach according to the word of God. That we preach and that we would teach a sound doctrine. A sound doctrine. I'm I'm not coming. I don't come with my own uh, hobby horse and stand up to you and, and give you my opinion. It must be the Word of God. If ever we start preaching other than the Word of God, go somewhere else. Amen? We must have sound doctrine from the pulpit. The Word of God is authoritative. Our teacher, our guide. This is very important. This sound doctrine. What you sit, what you listen to, very important. As a matter of fact, there is an attack on sound doctrine today. In many evangelical circles today, they have taken scissors to the Bible. And they have cut out certain things that they no longer agree with. They have belittled the authoritative word of God. And they have put their own opinion over the word of God. Their own philosophies over the word of God. That's the day we're a part of. That's why this this message is so dear to my heart today. You see, in in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 to 4, Paul writes to the believer. Yes, to Timothy. Any believers here today? Come on, any believers? Okay, so look what Paul writes to you. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. So in other words, you don't use it as a club. You don't use it to beat somebody up with. No, no, you can do this gently. Right? You do this gently, and you allow the Holy Spirit to do the conviction. But that's what the Word of God says. All long suffering and teaching. Watch now. For the time will come when they... Who are they? Those that are sitting in churches. Time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires. Oh, my. I could just spend an hour right there. People wanting a platform. People wanting an agenda. People wanting their own way having their own cause, puffing themselves up. But listen, the Bible says, but according to their own desires, because they have itchy ears, they will heap up for themselves, teachers, and they will turn their ears away from what? From the truth. What is the truth today? Pilate stood in front of Jesus and said, what is the truth? And the truth was standing right in front of them. Do you know the truth today? The truth is the word of God. The truth is the word of God. They'll turn from the truth and be turned aside to fables. The Bible is the word of God. The Bible is truth. It's infallible. It's reliable. It's trustworthy. It's our guide in all matters of life. It's free from all falsehood. There's no mistake in the Bible. There's no failure in the Word of God. It's true. It's pure. It's righteous. It's dynamite. The Word of God. Listen, listen to this statement. You might want to write it down. Just as Jesus is God manifested in human flesh, yet without sin, so the Bible is God's word communicated through humans, yet without error. I love that. 
Just as Jesus is God manifested in human flesh yet without sin, so the Bible is God's word communicated through humans yet without error. Praise God. The Bible. Uh, the Bible means book. Bibos. B I B L I E S or O S. Means book. It means book. But the thing that sets this book apart is the word holy. Holy Bible. Holy means set apart. You know that? It means set apart. A book that is set apart. It's not like any other book. It's a special book. Because it's been God-breathed, it's inspired, it's authoritative, it's a holy, set-apart book. So the Bible is a book that is holy or set-apart. And in the Bible, there are 66 books. 66 books. 39 in the Old Testament. 27 in the New Testament. 66 books. Okay, let me ask you now, have your spiritual ears on. How many authors? No, you're not listening. I just, do I have to go right back to start at point one again? One author. Come on. One author. Come on. Gotcha. One author. 40 plus Writers, right? Let's get it straight. One author, 40 plus. I say 40 plus because some of the books we don't really know who wrote, like Hebrews. We have good indication who wrote it. But So more than 40 writers in the Bible. So 40 writers, one author, that being Almighty God. Over, so uh, over three continents. And I believe it's 1,500 years span. So that brings me to my third point. The Bible is amazing. Will you say amen to that? Can I tell you the Bible is a miracle? What you hold in your hands, those holy scriptures, it's a miracle. Have you ever thought about how accurate and consistent the Bible is? The Bible is internally consistent with itself and externally existent, uh, consistent with history. Now, when they examine any ancient document, three manuscript tests are used to determine the reliability of what is written. Any ancient document will go through these three tests. The bibliographic test, there's the eternal evidence test, and the external evidence test. And you can read this uh, for yourself. Uh, I'm just going to touch the tip of the iceberg. The, bibble, the bibliographic test determines the accuracy of the Bible as it was recorded throughout history. It tests to see if our current scriptures include the original intent, the original words or content. Are you with me? That's what that test, the bio biographic test determines the accuracy because over the years, over the years, over the centuries, things can get diluted. Look, I think I'm losing you. Things can get um, misinterpreted. So this is a very important test. You need to know this, that they do this test to make sure. And some of you have different translations. The translation you have 
you should check and make sure that the translation that you carry, that is perhaps your favorite, is a close, um, close with the wording to the original. Because if it's not, it can lead you astray. So this is a test that they do on, uh, on these uh, ancient manuscript to make sure that your Bible, the translation that you have, you know King James, <laughs> we were talking about this earlier, the, you know the King James Version is a translation. It's not, <laughs> it's not the original. Come on. Now, you choose, but you need to choose according to which is the closest to the original writings. It's a test uh, of scriptures to include the original meaning or intent of the scripture. Okay? The next one is the internal evidence test determines the accuracy of those texts. So I was thinking of, of, of the accuracy of those texts. And this is, this is amazing. This is my point. The Bible is amazing, okay? Say amazing. Watch this. We think of other writings or other religions or other faith. And so I, I was thinking of the, uh, the Buddha, Buddha, Buddha religion. They are writings from one man. One man. The Quran contains the words of one man compiled by others after he died. Now, the Bible, you compare uh, the other religious writings to the Bible, and I want to tell you that the Bible can stand up against any of them, any of them, and ca come out in front. The Bible consists, we just heard, 66 books, 40-plus different writers over a period of 1,500 years, you say, Pastor Bob, so what are you saying? Here's my point. Very few of the writers of the Scripture ever met, right? I mean, Isaiah never met uh, uh, Paul or John. Never met. So there was no way that they could conspire to put the Scriptures together over 1,500 years. That's impossible. But you see what I'm saying? It's amazing. 1,500 years, three different continents, 40-plus authors, and it all works out. Amazing. It's a miracle. Humanly, it's impossible for that to happen. The eternal evidence proves scriptures are consistent. From Genesis to Revelation, consistent. Let me just add this. 700 years before Jesus' arrival, Isaiah wrote about his virgin birth. What? A virgin birth? Isaiah. Now, I know pot wasn't legalized during Isaiah's day. But he writes, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that 700 years that there's going to be a virgin and she's going to give birth to a child. Amazing. And then Micah comes along and he says that child is going to be born in Bethlehem where he would be born king, savior. Amazing. And then King David. Do you know King David wrote about Jesus' crucifixion a thousand years before Jesus was nailed to the cross? How is that possible? But the inspiration of God. 500 years before any historic record of the practice of crucifixion, David prophesied about it. In fact, Research tells you the first recorded crucifixion was in the 5th century 
before Christ. That's amazing. 500 years even before that, David is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit about this crucifixion of the Savior. I mean, Daniel is full of prophecy. Daniel prophesied that there'd be a great empire that would dominate the world, and then suddenly it would be cut off, and Daniel wrote that it would later be divided into four empires. Those four empires would become two, and out of that two would become one. And, and the Messiah would come. At that point, the Messiah would come. 500 years before Jesus was born, Daniel was writing these things. That is called the inspiration of the Scripture. God breathed upon these holy men and women. Incredible, eternal evidence for the re reliability of the Scriptures that you hold in your hand. You need to know this. The third test is the external evidence test. Maybe we could put them back up on the screen. Uh, you could leave the notes up there just for a little bit. The external evidence test, now that examines other historic documents written during the same time as the Bible to determine if the text is confirmed or contradicted by external documents. So what does that mean? That means they'll take the ancient scriptures, and they will look for other ancient scriptures that were written around the same time as the Bible to see and make sure that they don't contradict each other. It's the external evidence test. So, uh, like the Dead Sea Scrolls confirm the scriptures. The writings of Josephus, uh, a, a Hebrew uh, historian, confirms the scriptures. So they compare all these things. Now, scholars say, this is what scholars say, 99.5 of the Bible has been corroborated by other historic documents. Now, I'm not a scholar, but I would say 100%. I'm just going out on the limb and saying 100%. But those who have done all this research and done all these three tests, isn't that incredible? 99.5% is corroborated with historic documents. I'm telling you, the Bible is amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing, accurate, and consistent. Biographic, eternal, external evidence confirms the, the scriptures are true. Hallelujah. Christ came 2,000 years ago. Nearly 3,500 years have passed since the first scripture was written. Book of Moses, uh, the first scripture, I believe it was Job. First book was Job. Then you, you have the book of Moses, the uh, five, the Pentateuch. 35 years have passed since the first scripture was written. No book has been more thoroughly studied. No text has been more painstakingly scrutinized. Yet it has always come out on top. Always come out proven true. 40 different writers produced 66 books over a span of 1,500 years that are so in sync. Amazing. What a miracle. What a miracle. You see, you need, you need, I need to know this. We need to know this. You need to know what you believe. You need to be able to take the word of God and rightly divine, divide the word of truth. You need to know why you believe the Bible. You need to know for the sake of your salvation. And how to live, how to govern yourself through good times and through bad times. What does the Bible say about that? You all need to know. We all need to know that. When, when you go to university, when you go to college, when you're talking to your neighbor, 
And they, they bring up the subject, well, how do you know the Bible is true? How do you know that man just didn't write the scriptures? Now you can tell them. You can go online and get these notes. You can do the study for yourself because we should be defenders of our faith. We should be able to rightly divide the word of God. That's all of us. Because it's going to come up in your dialogue. It's going to come up in question. How, How do you know you're saved? Can you answer that? How do you know you're saved? How do you know you're going to go to heaven? That's it. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the. I said for the. Tells me so. That's how I know. That's how I know. The Bible tells me so. And I believe the word of God. I have faith in the word of God. The Bible tells me so. God's word is amazing. It's true. So we believe that the Bible is inspired. We believe the Bible is the authority which governs our lives. But here's where the rubber hits the road today. Do you value the scriptures? Do you value the scriptures? I want you to put up, I don't know, oh, yeah, put this up. Just flash it, flash it up there. Those are things we've already talked about. Those are things that we need to really consider as believers. Do we value the word of God in a society, in a world that does not value the word of God? The Bible is complete and in need of nothing. It stands by itself. You know, I I went online, I googled... uh, Because a lot of people think, well, this is just simply a a self-help book. And so I Googled self-help books. And do you know there's over 84,000 self-help books? Isn't it amazing? Over 84,000 self-help books. There's even a book to help you write a self-help book. (laughs) Listen, this is not a self-help book. This is the inspired, authoritative word of God. Hallelujah. And and we we need to value, we need to value this book. You can't value the word of God only on Sundays. I think what made David a man after God's own heart, in spite of his failures and uh, his shortcomings and even his victories, what made him a man after God's heart, I believe, was his hunger for the word, his passion for the word. He loved the word of God. He he wanted to obey the word of God. We need to have a passion for the word of God. You you need to get in to the scriptures. The Bible says rightly dividing the word of truth. You need to rightly divide the word of truth for yourself. Get a good uh, study Bible. Get a good commentary. And study the word for yourself. Don't take a scripture out of context. There's a lot of people, a lot of believers, that they'll they'll take a, a scripture, and they'll like a certain scripture, but they've taken it out of context. And what happens is they run with it. They run with it, but they're running into error. They're not running into truth. Because, you see, the word will back up the word. Listen to me. The word will confirm the word. You cannot pick and choose. You cannot cannot take a scripture out of context. You need to study that scripture and find out what the context, how it was given, the nature in which it was inspired. When Paul wrote to the church uh, 
He, he wrote to a church, the Corinthians church. He wrote to them. Then he wrote to the, the Galilee and the Philippine, uh, all those different churches, Philippi. They, they, he wrote to those churches, and some of them were under different contexts. And you need to understand that when you study the Word of God so you don't run into error. Don't take man's word for it. So we need to, we need to preach the Word of God. And, and this is a value in this church. You need to develop an appetite for the Word of God. The Bible says, like newborn babies, longing for the pure milk of the Word. So this ought to be a value in our life, church. As a believer, defines who we are. When it comes to God's Word, do you have a, a value in the Word of God? Or do you take it or leave it? Perhaps you bring it on Sunday, but it sits all week on the coffee table, and you don't even open it. It needs to be a value. The inspired, authoritative Word of God to guide us. Let, let, let's consider uh, uh, this. No book has been the object of more attacks and more scorn than the Word of God, the Scriptures, over the, over the ages. No book has been more despised or rejected like the Scriptures. It's been burnt, ridiculed, outlawed, but amazing, in spite of all these attacks, it continues to multiply. It continues to multiply. This is not the book of the month. This is the book of the ages. It's eternal. Heaven and earth will pass away. But his word will be eternally established in heaven. It's going to be according to his word that we are judged. According to the word of God. Hallelujah. God's word ought to be valued. Do you value the word of God? Do you love the word? Thank God for his word. I want you to stand with me just for a moment. I want you to take your scriptures, whatever form or fashion you have them in, hardcover or on your phone or iPad, whatever it might be today. Take your scriptures. You need to have the Word of God hidden in your heart. Somebody said this sometime, that if they were sent to a deserted island and they could only take one item, it wouldn't be my Harley. What would I take? I'd take the Word of God. I would take the Word of God. But do you know there are some countries... To have a Bible is against the law. And you would be in prison for carrying the Bible. And yet, how many of us have two, three, four Bibles at home? Do we value the Word of God? If you don't, I want to challenge you today. That you would allow Holy Spirit to do a work in your heart concerning His Word. Sunday morning attendance. Praise God for that, for this community. We're so glad you're here. And we love you. But you can take this word and you can have fellowship with the author of this book. Do you know the author? You can have fellowship with the author. Intimacy with the author. This is a love letter to you. Appreciate it. Value it. Every day, open up the precious word of God and begin to read it. But not just to tick off a religious duty or form that there I've done my devotions. Do it with the purpose of en encountering the author. To have an encounter with the author of this book that we love so much this inspired, authoritative word of God. Have an encounter with him. 
It might be that you only read 10 verses, but you pause and you ask Holy Spirit to give you a revelation in those 10 verses, that he opens up your understanding, that you get closer to the author of this book, that he begins to speak to you. Can I tell you that 90% of the time the Lord speaks to me, it's through the word of God. It's through this precious book. God begins to speak to me. I have fellowship with the author of this book. You can have fellowship with the author of the Bible. Isn't that incredible? I mean, that's amazing. That's so powerful. Value this book. Love this book. Digest this book. Read this book. Study this book. Allow this book to transform your life. The Word of God will never return void. Never return void. It will help you. It will guide you. It will protect you. It will defend you. But you have to put it inside you. It's sweeter than the honeycomb. The Word of God. How many have the scriptures with them today? I'm going to ask you to do something as we close. Oh, we got lots of time. Listen, I want you to, if you value this book, this holy book, if you value this book, I want you to pick it up. I want you to come and stand at the front with me just for a few moments. And we're going to, we're just going to worship the Lord just for a moment and thank him for his inspired, authoritative word. We're going to value the Bible today. So if that's you, and you have a a respect and a value for this Bible, would you come, bring your scriptures with you. Bring your Bibles. If if they're hard cub, iPad, on your phones, but just bring them. Come in close. Where we're we're coming, we're going to sing. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Our Father everlasting, the all creator. Would you make room for others? Just move in nice and close. God Almighty.